Okay, I want you to turn to Psalm 103. This is David's psalm. And it starts out saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Okay, David's spirit is telling, he's telling his soul what to do. He's reminding himself to bless God, and he's reminding himself not to forget the benefits that God's given. Now, these two demands that David has required of himself, these are the two things that will open him up into king, to kingdom living. And it's the same way for us today. These are the two things now that we can do that will cause any of God's children to enter into a kingdom living. And that's why Psalm 103 is such an important scripture for the believer. Okay, now we're going to take these verses and we're going to take them one at a time. So the first part of verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. You know, have you ever stopped to let it dawn on you that we have the capability on the inside of us now to bless the God of the universe? I want you to think about that. You know, the God that created the entire universe wants us to each one individually stop and take out time to bless him. Now, it goes beyond our comprehension to realize that we have the capability of blessing the God of the universe. Now, my first thought when I started meditating on this scripture was to wonder, Lord, how on earth do we bless you? You bless us all the time, but how do we bless you? And these are some of the things now that began to come to me. Number one, when David first began to bless the Lord, it started out as an attitude before it was an action, if you'll think about it. Uh, uh, it something on the inside of him started rising up to make him start realizing that he needed to bless God. So how do we develop that kind of an attitude to want to bless the Lord? Okay, let's read verse one again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Okay, notice that the first thing that David does, did was to require it of himself. He was telling his soul. He said, soul, bless the Lord. All that's within me now, start blessing God. You know, have you ever stopped to realize that everything that's within you is supposed to be blessing God? That, that's supposed to take place. Now, when we find a phrase in the Bible, we need to check it out because sometimes it can be just one little phrase and it can be a key that will unlock the unknown. And that's what we're finding here in Psalm 103. David required of himself that all that was within him was to bless God. And he started requiring it of himself. And see, sometimes we forget that there's some certain things that we need to require of ourselves, certain things that we need to talk to ourselves and say, this is something you're going to do. It's just going to be done. And so we need to ask ourselves, okay, if David is saying all that's within me, bless the Lord, we need to start realizing what's within me then. What is in there to bless the Lord? Okay, in Matthew 22, verse 37, it, uh, Jesus is talking and he said we're to bless the Lord with our heart, with our soul, and with our mind. And then he's quoting out of Deuteronomy 6, uh, 6 verse 5, and when you read that one, it adds another portion to it. It's telling us there to bless the Lord, love the Lord with our heart, soul, mind, and then it adds strength. We also do it with our strength. Okay, that's all the things that are within us. And when we think about it, our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, everything, all of that should be blessing God at all times. Now, Jesus was saying here in Matthew exactly what David was saying here in Psalm 103. And that's how, that's how we know to bless God. That's how we know how to do it. Okay, I want us to break this down. How do you love the Lord with your heart? Okay, in Proverbs 4, verse 23, and I'm going to name these twice so you can get the scripture reference because it's Proverbs 4, verse 23. It says to watch over your heart with all diligence. Okay, it doesn't just say watch over your heart. Watch over your heart with all diligence for from the heart flows the springs of life. The, uh, literally life is, is what's going to flow out of your heart. So we're to watch over our heart, not half-heartedly, but we're to watch over our heart with all diligence. In other words, God's saying put, put your whole being into this because that's the place from which flows the life itself, the life that's coming out of you. It flows out of your heart. Okay, what on earth does that mean? Whatever flows from your heart is what makes up the essence of your life. In other words, watch what starts coming out of your heart because that's who you are. That's who you really are. 
Okay, that's what your life consists of. So ask yourself, what is it that's flowing out of my heart? No one else can really answer these questions. We have to answer these questions ourselves. But our attitude, our devotion, the things we're devoted to, the things we're affectionate over, these are all coming from our heart. So I want you to think about your attitude first. You know, have you ever known someone who would do all the right things, but they hated doing it? You know somebody that would do that? They were doing the right things, but they hated it. Okay, that's really the attitude of their heart. It's not what they're doing that's the attitude of their heart it, it, uh, that shows their heart. It's the, it's the attitude behind it. Someone who's created uh, is critical most of the time. If you'll notice, no matter how they justify how they feel, that they feel like that they have a right to be critical because they don't like this or they don't like something else. But those constant critical attitudes, they're, what they're doing, it's picturing the essence of their heart, what's down in their heart. So God says, work on your attitude. He said, I want you to love me with your attitude first, not just with your actions, but he's saying, love me with your attitude first. You know, have you ever been in a praise service and it irritated you because the song service lasted so long? I've known people and they sang and they stayed with it, but they were irritated. Okay, they weren't blessing the Lord with their heart because they weren't blessing the Lord with their attitude. So God's requiring first our attitude. It's not the actions that he's looking at first. He's looking at our attitude. Okay, then we're to love God with our, our devotion. Uh, I, there needs to be something on the inside of us, a, a devotion that literally comes up out of our heart. We need to ask ourselves, what am I devoted to? What really is my devotion? Now, a lot of people are devoted to maybe a certain club. Some people are devoted to maybe a, a certain political party. Others are devoted to a ministry. Some people uh, are, are, are devoted to just different things in this world. But God's saying, I want your devotion to be toward me first. He requires it first to him. So we're to love God with our heart, and we're doing that when we're devoted to him, when we love him with our devotion. So we need to ask ourselves, what is it that holds my affection? What, what does my affection go toward? What is it that I like? Do I like to eat? Do I like to be entertained? You know, do I like to maybe uh, sleep late? Does a certain individual hold my affection? Maybe uh, my work, maybe what I do at work, maybe that holds my affection. What is it that holds our affection? that means a great deal to us. Can we honestly say, God, I love you more than all these other things that hold my devotion and my affection. I love you more than that. Lord, I love you more uh, than uh, my affection for eating, or I love you more than my affection of having my own way. See, God is telling us in Proverbs that we're to guard those things that come up out of our heart. And he tells us to guard it. It, that, that's our responsibility. We're to guard our attitude. We're to watch over and guard our affections. And notice, what is it that, what is my attitude in these different areas? What am I affectionate about? We need to guard against them the tug of the enemy because I'm going to tell you what, uh, those things that come up out of our heart, that's what is making up the very essence of our life. Okay, next he says to love him with all of our soul. What is the soul? It's our mind, our will, and our emotions. Your will is where you make your choices. So your will is a part of the soulish realm, and your choices are, are the things that, that are literally developing, and, and they're creating your entire life. We're to love God with our will. And one time I started saying, well, Lord, how on earth do I love you with my will? See, your will is that decision-making part of, of your very being. So the way that we love the Lord with our soul, with our will, is simply by making decisions that exemplify that love. Every decision we make is, is showing how much or how little love we have for the Lord. You're going to find out if you're loving God with all of your will, you'll find that the decisions you make are going to show forth that love. So we need to ask ourselves, do the desires that I make and the decisions that I make indicate that I truly love God. And no one else can answer that except I, I'm the only one that can answer it for me and you're the only one that can answer it for you. 
Am I making decisions to go God's way or am I making decisions to go my own way? No one can answer that except uh, we answer it for ourselves. It's a decision. It's a choice. And God wants us to learn to love him now with our choice. That's in our soulish realm. And that's where we make that decision. That's where we decide. Okay, let me give you this illustration. The wiring in a house has no power on its own. It simply brings power from the powerhouse and it takes it into our physical house. Your spirit's just like the wiring in a house because our spirit man, it has no power of its own, but it transmits the power from the powerhouse of God and transmits it on into our physical house, into our body. But I want you to notice something. When the electricity comes through the wiring, it doesn't just automatically flow on into the room. There's a switch. And if that switch is turned off, then it stops it. There's power in the wire, but it won't let it go on into the house. But if that switch is turned on, then that power is going to flow on in and the lights will turn on. But if that switch is turned off, there's no power flowing into the room, even though that, that line is full of electricity. You could cut that wire and possibly be electrocuted because the, there's electricity in the wire, but it's stopped. It's not allowed to go on into the house. Okay, the same thing is true in our life. We can have all kinds of power coming from God into our spirit man. But if our soulish realm, if our switch, our will is turned off to the spirit of God, it'll hold that power of God back. But if it's turned on, and we do it with our will, God doesn't do it, it's something we do. If it's turned on, it'll let it flow on in. Because your soulish realm is the switch. And God's wanting us to keep our soulish realm switched on to God so that, uh, with our will, so that whatever is coming into us, we'll let it flow on out. We'll make that choice. And then he says that uh, by making that decision, it's going to exemplify his love. That's what's going to show to the world that we love him. Now, your personality is a manifestation of your, of your soul. Your, your personality is made up with how you act and how the world sees you. And we love God by letting that personality reflect Jesus. If you're a real bubbly, excited person, then you need to let that excitement help you share Jesus. Where when people see you, that excitement is just uh, showing Jesus every moment. Uh, if, if you have a quiet, reserved personality, then let your life in that quiet strength, that quiet wisdom then reflect the Lord. See, how we act, how we respond is to be a reflection to the world that Jesus Christ is living on the inside of us. And then Jesus said that we're to love him with all of our heart. Okay, we love him with, with all of our soul, with all, all of our might. Okay, when we love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, then, uh, because a lot of people don't think about the fact that they need to love God with their mind. They don't realize that. Okay, the Lord began showing me that we love him with our heart, our soul, and our mind. How do we love God with our mind? We need to ask ourselves, where do I spend, what do I spend my time thinking about? You know, what am I absorbing into my subconscious? See, the things on which we dwell, the things that we think about, those are the things that make up our intellect. We're to love God by putting into our mind the things that please God. Dwelling on, absorbing all those things. That, what do we read? You know, we, we need to ask ourselves, did the majority of my, my reading come from the secular realm? You know, is it always maybe Sports Illustrated or maybe Home Journal or, or maybe Time Magazine or maybe just the newspaper? See, there should be a lot of our reading time where we choose to love reading and meditating on the things of God. That's how we love him with our mind. See, whatever it is that we spend the majority of our time reading and listening to will tell us exactly whether we're loving God with our mind or not. Your emotions are a part of your soulish realm. And some people are afraid to love God with their emotions because they've seen people who got so caught up in emotionalism and they said, oh, I don't want that. You know, I, I, I don't want to go there. Well, see, God gave us our emotions and he wants us to learn how to love him with those emotions. So we need to ask ourselves, are my emotions joyful? You know, how often now do I on my own just sing praises to God? Not when I'm trying to impress anybody else, when I'm driving down the road by myself. How often am I just singing praises to God? 
How often do I find myself just being calm and peaceful and trusting God, trusting God in, in the face of a problem, knowing that there's absolutely nothing too difficult for God? How many times am I uh, thinking of a problem and thinking, this is okay, there's nothing too difficult for God. I'm putting this in God's hand. Or am I nervous and uptight and fearful, frustrated most of the time? See, the only way I can love God with my emotions is, are my emotions joyful toward God? Am I doing things to please God, to be excited about God? Or am I frustrated and, and nervous? See, God wants us to learn how to love him with our emotions by being joyful and peaceful and attentive to him, trusting him completely with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and by learning how then to be excited about God. Sometimes we have to teach ourselves and train ourselves to be excited about God. I can remember there was a time that I, I didn't realize that uh, people trained themselves to be excited about God. I just thought some people are excited about God and some people are not. But I realized the Word teaches us that we're to train ourselves to be excited about God. We're to train ourselves in that area. See, we're a trained being. We're a body. We're a soul, a mind, will, and emotions. And we're a spirit. Our spirit is what contacts God. Now, the spirit of man is God conscious. That's what contacts God. That's how we, uh, we don't really contact God with, our, uh, with our, our body necessarily. We contact God with our spirit man. But the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions, the cho uh, choices that we make, these are self-conscious. God created us that way so that we could be in contact with ourselves and who we are. And, and start training ourselves in these areas. And we live in a physical body. The body's our earth suit. The body is what is worldly conscious. And God created us that way. And it's through this body that we contact and communicate with the world with our five physical senses. Okay, we're to love God with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. So that's the last way that God's telling us to love him. Our, our strength represents that physical body. And we're to love God now with our physical activities. You know, one has only to survey the things that he does, how he spends his time, you know, how he spends his money, where he goes. And that's going to show him whether or not he's loving God with his strength and with his body. Taking care of this physical body is one way in which we love God with our strength because the body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that's going to show us something. See, it's in him that we should physically live and move and have our being. Okay, in Psalm uh, 103, after we've blessed God with all that's within us, when we bless God with our heart, with our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, we've blessed God with our strength, then it says in the last part of verse 1 that we're to bless his holy name. Have you ever thought about the fact that God says you are to bless my holy name? See, a part of blessing God is understanding that his name is holy. We need to guard ourselves against using religious-sounding words as, as bywords, where we say things like glory or hallelujah or oh God or oh my Lord just to preface our sentences. You know, so many times it's easy for a Christian to slip into that. And uh, we do that sort of like many times like somebody else would use a cuss word. Sometimes we'll be using in the name of Jesus, and it can become a byword when it has no meaning, when it's just a cliche. We need to break those habits of where it's just easy to say, oh, hallelujah, or oh, glory be to God, oh, bless God. Those can be bywords that mean nothing. They're just, they're, thank goodness it's not a cuss word, but it's, it means no more than just we're going to dinner tonight. You know, it means nothing. But when we bless his holy name, it needs to be something where uh, all of a sudden we're thinking about, Lord, I love you. I bless your holy name. Lord, I glory in you. Hallelujah, Lord. You are good. You're everything to me. It, the attitude of the heart needs to come out in those words that we're using. Even though they're religious sounding words, we need to be careful that they have the meaning behind it. Then when those words come out of our mouth, it's not going to be a repetitious byword. It's going to be a heartfelt blessing. We're actually blessing his holy name. 
See, it should be a verbal expression of what's going down on, on the inside of us. When we say glory, hallelujah, that needs to be because on the inside, we are thinking about how glorious God is, where we're wanting to exalt his name, where we're wanting the world to know that God is holy. His, his name is holy. See, when hallelujah comes out of our mouth, like a byword, uh, then what that's doing, it's expressing what's in our heart. And that can be scary. We need to think about that. When we begin to love God with our heart, with all of our, with our attitude, with our affections, with our devotion, when we start blessing God with our soul, our emotions and our feelings, when we start blessing God with our will, where we're making all those right choices, we're, we're choosing right every time. When we start blessing God with our mind, our thought life, uh, when we learn to love him with our strength, our activities, our body, when we learn to reverence his name, where when we, every time a, 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 a spiritual word comes out of our mouth, we're meaning it. It means something to us. And it's going to manifest and show up in every single thing we do. That's what God's wanting us to do, where we're loving him with our, just like he says, with our heart, with our soul, everything in our soulish realm, with our mind, our intellect, and when we're loving him with our strength. A team of horses then couldn't hold back what, what starts happening in the spiritual realm. Then you'll find yourself beginning to really desire to tell God how much you love him. See, when we, uh, when we get out of just, uh, just habitual, uh, just words that mean nothing to us, and we move on over into that coming up out of our spirit man, I'm telling you, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing that'll hold us back spiritually. Uh, it'll become the most natural response in the world when we're alone to just find ourselves telling the Lord how much we love him. You know, telling him how wonderful he is. Tell him, oh God, I, I just don't even have words to express how good you are. I don't even have words to express, Lord, how much I appreciate what all you're doing for me. When, when that starts coming up out of our innermost being, then all of a sudden, it starts changing everything in our life. It starts changing the, us then, body, soul, and spirit. And we'll find out there's no room for rebellion then. You don't have to work to get rebellion out. When, when we work on letting our body, soul, and spirit love and, and, and cherish and bless the Lord, rebellion has no place. You don't even have to worry about it. It won't even be there. Okay, those are the two actions when it's genuine praise and genuine obedience, then all of a sudden that's going to be the telltale sign that we're loving God with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And treating his name as genuine, as holy. When it's genuine praise, genuine obedience. Now I'm a firm believer that obedience should never have to be taught if we have a love walk established. If we establish that love walk and we come into a place where we, where we truly are loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and have that love walk in place, then uh, we, we wouldn't, wouldn't even have to pay any attention to uh, teachings of obedience because it's in there, you know. It's not something we have to train ourselves. It's there because, see, a natural response to love is obedience. I want you to really hear that because a natural response to love is obedience. If there's true love there, then you don't have to develop obedience. It's just there. It's already developed. And that's why Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Because that's exactly what he's saying. He, he's saying uh, it, it's just a natural thing. It's not even anything that you have to make happen. And, and you can see that in the physical realm. It becomes, you become more in love uh, with him every day. Every time you practice this, it gets better and sweeter all the time. And the Lord began to show me that I thought I loved my husband so much when I married him 57 years ago, you know. But uh, after 57 years, you know, I realized I was much more in love with him after 57 years than I was back in 1960 when we first got married. And I noticed that I was much more eager to please him and bless him and be obedient to him after 57 years than I was when we first married. And it's exactly the same with God. The more that, that we're with him, the more we want to please him, the more we want to be obedient to him, 
uh, that, uh, that love just starts bubbling up out of us, and that obedience is just a byproduct. It's not anything we have to work at. Okay, in verse 2, it says that we're to bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Okay, I remember reading that. I said, Lord, what, what are all the benefits? Okay, the Lord said it's the benefits of the covenant that I've given to my children. Now, I used to read that, and I'd think, you know, why did David have to remind himself not to forget the benefits? You know, you look at that, and it says, don't forget the benefits. And I remember thinking, you know, I might forget a point of obedience at times, but I certainly would never forget the benefits, you know. Uh, who would forget the benefits? We all enjoy benefits. So it sounds strange for David to command his soul not to forget the benefits. Well, I, I want to do a little bit of an experience here. Don't look at your Bible right now. But David was telling himself not to forget the benefits. Now, without looking at your Bible, how many of these benefits can you name? Because we've read this scripture. You've all read this scripture many times. Can you name one or more of those six benefits that David said not to forget without looking? Okay, the point I'm making or trying to make is uh, we think, oh, I'd never forget the benefits. You know, I might forget other things, but I'm not going to forget the benefits. But that's a, it's a lot easier to forget than you think. You know, if you don't keep those benefits before your eyes, if you're not reminding yourself to remember the benefits, we do forget. Be honest with yourself. How many of these six benefits did you know without looking? How many could you have named the six benefits? Those were wonderful benefits, you know. And, uh, you know, you think, okay, I'd never forget benefits. How many of you could remember three of them? Could you, could you remember even one of them? Oh, okay, I want us to see that as magnificent as these benefits are, Unless we do exactly what David said to do, we're going to forget the benefits. David said he reminded himself, don't forget any of the benefits. Okay, in verses 3 through 5, he starts naming the benefits. Who, one of the benefits is that God pardons all of your iniquities. He heals all of your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. He satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Every one of those benefits are magnificent benefits, and yet many times we forget them. We don't even remember what they were, as wonderful as they are. You'd think that every day and every hour we would be down on our knees thanking God and, and just worshiping over these wonderful benefits that he's given us. That should be what we're doing every day. And... But that's why we need David's example. He's telling us, remind yourself, don't forget the benefits. We need to remind ourselves every day, Lord, I'm not going to forget these benefits. These are wonderful gifts that you've given me. There are literally whole denominations who have forgotten the benefits. And a lot of them have forgotten them to the point they even deny that they exist. There are some denominations, they'll deny these. They don't even exist. Some will even go so far that they try to prove that they don't exist. You know, in my wildest imagination, I can never figure out why on earth anyone would try to prove that these benefits didn't exist. Kind of like shooting ourselves in the foot, <laughs> you know. Why would we do that? And yet many people do that, you know. Uh, you can't imagine how many people I've known through the years who tried to deny that healing existed. It died with the apostles, you know. And some people spend their time and their energy and their intellect trying to disprove the benefits of God. Why would we do that? And, and yet, people do that all the time. See, if we forget the benefits, we're never going to have the privilege of enjoying them. Now, this is a silly illustration, but I want you to hear the principle involved. Uh, one day, I was in the grocery store, and I noticed a cluster of really good-looking grapes, you know. They weren't in season, and they were priced pretty high, but they looked so good, I decided I would get them for a treat for the family. Well, I got home, I put them in the refrigerator, and we were busy for the next several days. Well, by that time, I'd forgotten all about those grapes, didn't even remember that they were there. And one night after dinner, Jack said that he was hungry for something sweet, and I still didn't remember the grapes. Well, a few more days went by, and finally, several weeks had gone by, and I was going through the refrigerator, and I saw this sack in the back. And 
I thought, what is in there? I pulled it out. There were the grapes. By now, they were shriveled up and they were ruined. And I had them in my possession all that time. They were mine. I could have eaten them at any time. But I lost the benefit of them because I forgot about them. Now, I know that's a silly example, but I want you to hear the principle. People who forget the benefits of God will very often lose those benefits completely. You know, forgetting is a way of losing in, in any area. When you forget something, that's a way of losing it. Okay, now by the same token, remembering the benefits, focusing on the benefits, thanking God for them, thinking about them, meditating on them, that's a way of receiving those benefits. And that's why God tells us, you know, uh, don't forget the benefits. Now, I've noticed that many times uh, in these large companies, if you'll notice, they will have an employee meeting for the sole purpose of educating those employees about the benefits that, they're, that the co company is offering. And they'll spend a whole, maybe a whole day just trying to educate their people on the benefits that they want to give to them, you know. Uh, maybe it's their sick leave, maybe it has to do with hospitalization or a dental plan or a vacation or whatever. You know, when, when we joined the family of God, the army of God, he too has a benefit plan and he instructs us on the benefits. Otherwise, if, if we don't keep our, our mind thinking about the benefits that he's given us, we'll just forget about them. Okay, the number one benefit in verse 3 is he, bar he pardons all of our iniquities. Okay, there is an understood, unspoken condition to this first benefit. The understood, unspoken condition is genuine repentance. And so if we want to remember that benefit, then we have to also remember that the, the way we get it, the way we receive it, is genuine repentance when we've done something wrong. Now, apart from the cleansing blood of Jesus, there's no forgiveness of sin. True, genuine repentance is the prerequisite now for receiving uh, these, uh, this first benefit. Now, if we're blessing God with our whole being, like we talked about earlier, then true repentance would just be all, almost an automatic response. You won't even have to try. It won't even take any effort. A lifestyle of blessing God will put the same attitude in our heart that David had in, in Psalm 51. And boy, he had the right attitude. If you'll remember, he was praying. He said, wash me, Lord, from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Purify me, he said, and when you purify me, I'm going to be clean. Wash me, he said, and I'll be whiter than snow. And God does. He washes us with the blood when we repent. Now, David went on to say, create within me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit on the inside of me. He said, oh, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore the joy now of my salvation. See, we're going to find out that once we sin, our joy is gone. Even if it's just the sin of worry, you'll find out your joy is out the door. But when Psalm 51 literally became the attitude of our heart, then God says, I, I will pardon all your iniquities. Doesn't matter how big the sin might have been, when we turn to God, he says, I'll pardon all your iniquities. And that's what he meant down in verse 12 when he said, I'll put your sin as far as the east is from the west. And that's how uh, he, uh, he has removed our transgressions from us. Because the east and west never meet. And he removes, removes them as far as the east is from the west. You know, Corey Ten Boom is famous for quoting Micah 7, 19. Micah 7, 19 says, God takes our sin and puts them in the depth of the sea. That's quite a promise, you know. But Corey went on to say, God puts my sins in the depth of the sea when I repent, and then he puts a no, up a no fishing sign. <laughs> and, uh, but what do we do? So many times we go fishing and we try to haul those sins right back up by remembering them and maybe grieving over them or, or maybe repeating them. But God's wanting us to allow him to pardon our iniquities. He wants to stop that sin cycle. In Jeremiah 5, 25, Jeremiah 5, verse 25, your sins have withheld good from you. Think about that. I mean, he's making it very clear here that what withholds the good from us are our sins. And that's why God wants us to repent. That's why he wants us to be pardoned because it's our sin, our iniquities, not God, that withholds the good. Okay, then in Isaiah 53, verse 5 in the Amplified, Isaiah 53, 5, 
foretold that the Messiah would die for us and take in the Amplified our sin, our guilt, and our consequences. You know, a lot of people think, okay, my sin can be forgiven, but I'm still going to have to bear the consequences. But God's telling us, no, when we truly repent, he removes the sin, the guilt of that sin. We don't have to feel guilty. And he removes the consequences. God says he pardons. Later, I want you to look up the word pardon in the Webster's because it means to release a person from the punishment. When we get pardoned, we're released from the punishment. You know, even in our government, uh, when the president pardons somebody, then He's released from the punishment. He no longer has to bear the punishment. And it's the same way in the kingdom of God. To cancel the penalty and excuse the debt, that's what God does. He cancels the penalty and excuses the debt. You know, he releases us from the punishment. He cancels the penalty and he excuses us because he puts it under the blood where it's cleansed. Now, that's what God does for us, and that's what he expects from us when we forgive people. You know, sometimes we're real, it's real, we're real quick to say, oh, I forgive you. But we have to forgive the way God forgives. And boy, I tell you what, that's some kind of benefit when God literally takes away the sin and removes the, pun the punishment. You know, it's hard for us to imagine a God that loves us that much. Now, that benefit is made possible not because God turned his hand, head, not because God turned his head and pretended that he didn't see the sin. That's not what happens. It's possible because Jesus came, he fulfilled the law, and he took the consequences and the curse on himself, on his own body. Okay, the number two benefit is in the last part of verse 3. He heals all of our diseases. Well, all of them except the ones that have progressed to the point that they've now become terminal. Of course, we know that those can't be uh, taken away. Is that what it says? Is that what it says? You know what? That's how a lot of people read it. Oh, yeah, he can forgive a headache and, and, and heal a headache, but not terminal sickness, not that. See, people put degrees not only on sin, but they also put degrees on sickness. And you'll find that everywhere you go where people put degrees on sickness. I never will forget an incident that happened several years ago. Angela and her friend were praying for this child, and they didn't hear what was wrong with the baby. They just heard that the baby had a pain in its head. So they thought she had a headache, and they prayed. Uh, and uh, the next week, this young mother was so excited, she was just elated, and she was saying, my baby's healed, my baby's healed. The doctor says my baby is totally healed. Well, Angela couldn't understand why she was that excited over a headache being healed. Well, come to find out what they had not heard the week before, that pain was there because the baby had a brain tumor. That pain had left, and when they took the new brain scans, there was no tumor. The tumor was gone. Angela and her friend, they nearly fainted because they thought they were praying for a headache, not a brain tumor. And so I asked her later, because Angela was young then, and I said, what, how would you have prayed differently if you'd known that it was a brain tumor? And she said, I don't know, but I would have done something different if I known it was a tumor, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so we mortals are so funny. We do put degrees on sickness just exactly like we put degrees on sin. God doesn't say, I'll heal your disease if it hasn't progressed too far. No, he says, I'll heal all of your diseases. It doesn't matter how serious it is. Deuteronomy 28, verse 6, uh, actually verse 61 Deuteronomy 28, 61, says every sickness and every disease, even the ones that are not listed in the book, are all a part of the curse. And then Galatians 3, 13 says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Do you realize what that's telling us? It's telling us that every sickness and every disease there in Deuteronomy, and it lists for pages, it lists all the different kinds of sickness. But it says every one, even the one, it even says, even the ones not written in this book are all a part of the curse. And then Galatians 3.13 says Christ redeemed us for, from the curse by taking it on himself. He redeemed us from everything listed over there in Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, clear to the end of the chapter. And if we appropriate that, you know, uh, it's ours. If, if we believe it, if we receive it. Now, Jesus paid a high price to redeem us. 
And in Isaiah 52, verse 14, when sin came into the world, death came in and everything leading up to death, including sickness. But just because you're sick doesn't mean that there's necessarily sin in your life, but sickness is the result of sin that's there in the world. And it, it was there. There was nothing that could be done about it. Man was doomed. But the good news is that the same God who says, I'll pardon all of your iniquities, also said, I will heal all your diseases. Think about how good God is. He didn't have to do that for us. I love that song, Isn't He Wonderful, Wonderful, Isn't Jesus My Lord Wonderful? I love that song. We used to sing it all the time. We need to constantly remind ourselves how good and how awesome our God is. Okay, the very first step now toward receiving your healing is just to believe in God's willingness as well as his ability. A lot of people believe in the, willing, uh, the uh, ability of God. They believe, oh, yes, God's able to heal, but they don't believe in his willingness. And God's saying, I want you not only to believe that I'm able, but I want you to believe that I'm willing. So settle the issue of his willingness, and don't doubt that again. Okay, the number three benefit there in verse 4 reads that uh, it says he redeems your life from the pit. Okay, pit means destruction when you look it up. Okay, the most important redemption from destruction that you'll ever receive is your redemption from hell. That's the main redemption. But we have a lot of years to live right here on this earth, so a part of the, the redemption is... Uh, we're redeemed from destruction in this life. That takes in um, so many things, so much destruction that's going on in this world. And that's why Psalm 91 verse 6 says, you will not be afraid of destruction. It will not even come near you. That's a part of our covenant. If we'll dwell now, uh, dwell and abide under the shadow of the Almighty, if we'll dwell and abide in his shelter, See, we need to forget not the benefit and confess regularly, I have been redeemed from destruction. That is such a precious promise. That's such a mighty promise. And yet, David had to remind himself not to forget that. We need to remind ourselves every day not to forget that, that promise. It's hard sometimes when Satan's fiery darts are falling all around us and, oh my, it just looks like the whole world's crumbling. But God says, one of my benefits is that I've redeemed you from that destruction. Now, I looked up the word destruction in Webster's Dictionary, and it says the state of being destroyed, the process of being destroyed. And all of a sudden, I saw something that I'd never seen before. A lot of times, we wait a long time before we apply this number three benefit. And we wait until the destruction is obvious, you know. But destruction starts a long time before it becomes obvious to the world. If you've ever seen a house that uh, had, was burned to the ground, or if you've seen maybe a house that's blown away in a tornado, it's very easy to see and say, boy, look at the destruction here. But have you ever been inside a house that just looked beautiful? Uh, uh, the paint job just looked new and beautiful. The walls, they weren't cracked. And you walked in and you thought, oh, what a beautiful home. But when you went down under the house, you found that the whole foundation was being eaten away with termites. Okay, that house was in the state of being destroyed. Uh, it, you didn't look at it and say, oh, that house is destroyed. But it was in the state of being destroyed. And that's hard to detect because it's not sh uh, showing, obviously. But we've got to recognize a life destroyed by cancer that can look like destruction. We recognize some of those things that... Uh, uh, where maybe a person is, has been practically destroyed because of drugs and alcohol, and we see that destruction. But sometimes we overlook the state or the process now of being destroyed. So we don't take advantage of this third benefit when we could have eliminated the problem before it ever took hold, before the, the hurt and the pain sets in. See, the first time that a husband or wife decide to sleep in separate bedrooms uh, because they had a fight, and they let the sun go down in the anger without making amends. That marriage just entered into the state of becoming destroyed. You can look at that marriage and you think, oh, boy, they're, they're doing so well. You don't see the destruction. But it's in the process of being destroyed. The first time that a teenage child willfully disobeys the parent and gets into rebellion, that child 
has just entered into the state of being destroyed. Those early stages of hurtful, ugly exchange of words, maybe between parent and child or maybe between a husband and wife, where uh, amends are not made, a relationship just entered into the state of being destroyed. And those first years where somebody began making unwise choices, maybe in their buying habits, and they begin to accumulate debt, that financial situation just entered into the state of being destroyed. Now, any one of those situations left alone, apart from God, will soon be, it'll become obvious. Pretty soon, somebody's going to be able to look at that marriage or that home or that something, and, and they'll be able to see the destruction. But God wants us to see that we don't have to let it progress. We don't have to let it all of a sudden uh, take over. You know, God wants us, the moment that something goes wrong, we stop right then and we repent and we stop the process. The, this benefit doesn't have to be held back uh, to use and, and apply after the destruction has already taken its toll. God's saying, I'll really redeem you from the state of being destroyed if you'll put it to work. I will redeem your life, and that includes everything that involves your life, whether it be your marriage, whether it be your children, whether it be relationships, whether it be your finances, whatever. God says, I will redeem anything of yours that's in the process of being destroyed. But we've got to recognize it, and we've got to say, oh, Lord, I, I see some signs here that don't look good. I'm bringing them to you. I'm going to appropriate your promise right here. Now, if you believe that any situation in which you find, find yourself is, is beyond repair, if you believe your situation is impossible to redeem, then you've forgotten the number three benefit. Okay, number four, the last part of verse four, says that he will crown you with loving kindness and with compassion. That's one of the promises. He'll crown you with loving kindness. He'll crown you with compassion. A crown denotes royalty. A crown, it, it encircles and it covers. And God's saying, I'm going to circle and surround you and cover you with royalty. Now, when we see a person in need, we might pick them up, dust them off, put a little money maybe in their pocket, and, and maybe help them find a job. But what does God do when he sees uh, us in need? See, he saw us in need before we were ever born. And he will pick us up, dust us off, adopt us as his own child, give us his name, put his royal blood in our veins, and then love us enough to die for us. That's how God does it. He crowns us literally with loving kindness and tender mercies. We can't even, with our, our natural mind, we can't even conceive uh, of, of how to the extent that God goes with this promise. There's no way to put a value or a benefit on that. You know, there was a well-known evangelist and song letter, uh, uh, songwriter, and he made this statement. He said, God is not some insensitive, invisible machine out there in the universe. He said, God has emotions, and he, when he sees one hand just simply reaching out in an attempt to say, God, I need you and I want you. He said, the very heart of God is moved, and he will begin to get that person in right position to receive. You know, sometimes we look and, and we see one person and, boy, they receive God and, and God starts working in their life and we see somebody else and nothing's working. They just go right on their, their downward spiral. And we say, you know, what's the difference? Well, the difference is one of them reached out. He might have reached out in the dead of night when, when he was lonely and said, God, I need you. And the other one didn't reach out because I can promise you when somebody reaches out, God is right there reaching his hand out to take them. And then he went on to say, if you can't do anything else except reach up in faith when you have a need, he said, do it. He said, if you can't do anything else, but just start reaching your hand up. Because he said, there is enough to come in contact with God's loving kindness and his forever mercies. Just that one little breach, that one little crying out, God, I need you. Okay, what if we served a God who crowned us with harshness? He crowns us with loving kindness. But what if he surrounded us with harshness instead of tenderness? You know, what if we served a God that crowned us with criticism instead of kindness? What if he, uh, we served a God who crowned us with what we deserved? You know, think about it. Okay, if you'll look on down to the uh, uh, last part of verse 10, it says that um, 
He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Okay, we deserve punishment, but he doesn't crown us with what we deserve, thank goodness. Okay, then the last benefits, benefits 5 and 6, are in verse 5. He satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. He satisfies us with good things. One of the reasons he satisfies us with good things is so that our youth can be renewed. Now, these are separate benefits, but they definitely work together because a part of having your youth renewed, a part of staying young, is being satisfied, and only good things are going to ultimately ever satisfy. You know, the Bible tells us that sin brings pleasure for a season, but if you'll notice, it never tells you that that satisfies. The sin will bring you some pleasure for a season, but it never says that it satisfies. In fact, just the opposite. Sin never satisfies. Now, too often what it does, it drive, drives us to try to experience bigger and better sin. Now, the good thing about God are all, the, all that ultimately satisfies is what he gives us, where we're ultimately satisfied. Now, in James 1.17, I love that scripture, James 1.17 tells us that the source of all good things he says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. So he gives us the source of everything that's good. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And then he goes on to say there's no variation from that fact. In other words, uh, good and perfect gifts don't come from above one time and come from someplace else another time. There's no variation, he says, and there's no shifting shadow of turning. In other words, you can't get a good gift from any other source other than from above. So this is important. Now, God has a priority system, and it's always God first. It can be uh, a good thing and still be out of God's priority system, and it can become bad uh, if, if we're not getting it from God. Our, our good things have to come from God, and the ones that come from God, they satisfy. When we go out and seek things for ourselves, we can be uh, after something that, that's good, but if we're trying to get it on our own and we're not going through God as our source, then it ultimately won't be good. But this is the exciting part. Anytime we give Jesus, who is the number one good thing, anytime we, uh, we do that, then, and he becomes number one priority in our life, something supernatural always happens because there is a spiritual principle involved. And all the other good things that come, will come upon you, and it says they overtake you. Okay, this is a secret. Uh, in Matthew 6, 33, it tells us to seek for first Jesus. Now, God satisfies us with all good things, but uh, we have to have those things in right priority. Okay, let me, let me give you a, a good way uh, to appropriate that benefit. In your quiet time with the Lord, just began naming back all those good things from God. It's kind of like that old song says, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it's going to surprise you what the Lord has done. And that's still one of my favorite songs because it works. As you start naming those good things in thanksgiving, it will reveal more and more of God's goodness. Now, sometimes we're so busy uh, getting good things for ourselves without... Uh, waiting for God to do it, that it still doesn't satisfy. It can be a good gift, but if we're the one searching for it, we're the one trying to get it, it's not going to satisfy. It's when we go through God, and he's the one who then gives us the good gifts. And um, uh, when I give myself a good thing, it's something that I've gone after. Maybe I've created debt to get it, or I've gotten it in the flesh. It's, uh, it's not going to bring the satisfaction. God's joy comes from his giving good things to his children. And he knows exactly when to give them and how to give those things so that they'll not hinder our spiritual growth. He satisfies us with good things so that our, our youth is renewed like the eagles. Okay, what the world calls good will never renew our youth. The things of the world, I tell you what, you age in a hurry when you start going after the things of the world. But God satisfies us now every single time with good things so that the benefit number six is that our youth will be renewed. Do you realize that very few people take that number six benefit literally? 
Maybe you haven't even thought about it literally. But our youth can literally be renewed as the eagle. Your youth can be renewed. Don't forget that benefit. We're going to have to focus in on that benefit if we're going to receive it. If you want your youth to be renewed as the eagles. See, it not, it's not God's will for his people to grow old the way the world grows old. It, I'm not saying that, that we can uh, stop the aging process. And, you know, I'm not trying to give you a weird doctrine. We're all going to grow older. But I'm saying that the sights that you often see in the hospital and the things that you see in nursing homes, those are not God's will. Change is going to come in our physical appearance, and it'll come in our physical body. But old age should be, uh, never be a time of physical failure. It should never be a time of misery, bitterness, or anger, or disappointment, or despair, or sickness. It should never be that. Uh, where we're old, and, and uh, that's not God's way. Uh, God says, I will renew your youth. In other words, we'll grow old, but we won't have the things that the world has when they're growing old. It, uh, in Deuteronomy 34, verse 7, when Moses died, he was 120 years old. He was sound in his body. He was still leading the people. His mind was a sound. He had all of his energy. He was able to climb the mountain, and it said that his eyesight was perfect. Okay, when it's time for us to go home and be with the Lord, God intends us to go home well. He intends that. Jack preached that all of his life. He said, a person does not have to go home sick. He would always tell me that. They don't have to go home sick. When it's time to go home, they can go home, but they don't have to go home sick. And I thought it was interesting that he just uh, was teasing me <laughs> and, uh, you know, sticking his finger in my ear and just, uh, just trying to keep me awake. We were trying to take an afternoon nap. And he just, I said, Jack, we've got to go to sleep because we've got cross lines tonight and we've got to get a nap. And he said, okay. And he closed his eyes and he was gone. That's how God wants it. I don't like the fact that he's gone, but it gives me a lot of hope and a lot of encouragement to realize we can just say, okay, it's time for me to go home. I found out later, which I didn't like that, but I found out that he had told a couple of people that he had finished the work that God had told him to do, and it was time for him to go home. He never told me that because I would have kicked and screamed, and he would have had to have changed his mind. But anyway, uh, but we don't have to go home sick, and a part of our benefit is that he renews our youth as eagles. Uh, we don't have to be sick to die. There's examples throughout the Word of God, uh, you know, where people had lived out their life, they were satisfied in their old age, and they simply were ready to go home, and they released their spirit to God and went home. Now, if we expect disaster and bad things to happen, you know, if we're expecting that, I can promise you, you'll have it. We need to really watch ourselves. What are we expecting? Uh, some people expect a, a, a loss of memory. Oh, I'm getting old, so I don't remember as well as I used to. Well, we may not remember as well as we used to, but you don't have to lose your memory, you know. Uh, you don't have to have one repair after another to keep that body going. That uh, is more than likely exactly what a person's going to have if that's what they're expecting. Uh, when we expect the things that the world is expecting, then those things are going to be inevitable. That means, uh, but what that means is that we've forgotten these benefits. But when we focus on these benefits... We're going to find out that those six benefits there are amazing. They cover everything in our life, even down to the fact that our, in our old age it's renewed like eagles. And when we focus on our benefits, a tremendous power then is released. So don't wait until you're old to start believing for your youth to be renewed. Start praying and claiming that benefit while you're young so you're trained for it as you get older. Now, all these benefits come out of two things. It comes out of, number one, of remembering them, just like David said, and out of a right relationship with the Father, like we talked about first. Now, no one can walk in these benefits apart from a vital union with God. So in closing, I want to point out one interesting thing. In Psalm 103, 1 through 5, what we've just looked at is it's really a commentary for Hebrews 11, verse 6. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. The one who pleases God 
first of all believes that he is, and then he believes that God is the rewarder. See, in Hebrews 11, verse 6, uh, uh, many times we'll say, well, how on earth? Well, Psalm 103, verse 1 through 5, is telling us how to do it. A lot of times one scripture will present something, a promise, and you think, well, oh, God, how do I receive it? And then you'll find another scripture that tells you how to receive it. And 103, Psalm 103 tells us how to receive a lot of the promises of God. Loving God with our whole being, body, soul, spirit, is the way that we put action into believing that he is. And then verses 3 through 5, forgetting none of the benefits, is the way that we believe that he is the rewarder. Father, I thank you for this Psalm 103. What a powerful, powerful uh, promise this is. Father, it, it's, a, it's a teaching that we should remind ourselves of every single day because it answers so many things. It gives us answers. And Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, that we truly do want to be just like David and we want to be able to say that we want to bless the Lord with our whole, everything that's within us, bless him. And then we want to forget none of the benefits. Father, I never, until I read th this scripture, I would never have thought about it being so easy to forget benefits. You wouldn't think that we would ever forget the benefits. But Father, when we forget the benefits, that means we don't get them. So I pray, Father, that not only will we bless you, bless your holy name, but I thank you, Father, that we will remember and thank you every day for the wonderful benefits, the wonderful things that you've given us. God, you are so good. We love you, Father. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.